uh, what is at the heart of your relationships? Not just your most intimate ones, but all of your relationships. Is it love? Is it uh, clear boundaries and clear direction? Is it dignity and respect? You know, for me, it's, it's trust. It's all about trust. And so I'm grateful to begin a two-part series called Your Trust Quotient this morning that's all about recognizing how important trust is to all levels of our relationship. And to me, ultimately, it's the key to unlocking greater possibility in your life. That's how powerful trust is. And the thing about trust as well is that it's never fixed. It's always fluid. You have to take care of it. You have to nurture it. Even those people you trust the most, you know, just one snickery comment, right? And those little dents come in. And so it's something we always have to take care of. Trust in relationships for me um, is like an engine. And when you take care of the engine, the ride is smooth, even along the bumps. Trust in community, whether it be uh, here at church or in work, uh, for me it's like water and we're the fish in it. When the water is clean, the fish are swimming. But when it's icky, when it's murky, we're bumping into each other and we don't know where we're going. Trust in relationship with spirit is like a panoramic view. When we're in distrust, we're in tunnel vision. We only see through our own eyes. But when we're in trust with life, even if we can't see everything around us, we see with a kind of wholeness, a kind of understanding. And so I asked the question as well this morning, how trusting are you? How trusting are you? Again, it's not a question of, that's fixed. It, it's fluid. And we, as a part of our uh, initiative, have kind of some supplemental material to go with this series. And, and one of them is called Your Trust Quotient. Uh, you can go online to the services page and you can just download it and open it up. It's a PDF. And there are just some questions for you to ask yourself that you can rate on a scale of uh, you know, whatever it may be there uh, to see where you are in relationship with, with trust. And, and they're about our relationship with God and life, with ourselves, and with each other. And so there, there's questions about our relationship with spirit like this. I take time daily to connect with the sacred within and around me. You know, probably more than anything else this year, I've worked with people who are struggling because they feel in this pandemic they've lost a sense of their spiritual connection. They've lost a sense of meaning and purpose. They feel separated to a degree with their source. I see a divine thread running through nature and circumstances around me, right? Not just when things are going good, but when things are going challenging. I know what I want. You know, it takes a lot of self-trust to know that you really know what it is that you want. It is easy for me to relax and enjoy my alone time, right? Is your alone time your time with your sacred or your time of freaking out about everything? <laughs> I am proud of who I am in my most intimate relationships. Hmm. Are you proud of who you are in your most intimate relationships? The people I love know how much I love them. This is always a yes or a no because they can always know more. But, but it shows how, how trust can show up uh, even as distrust. And distrust isn't a negative. You know, it, it means discernment. It means boundaries. And yet distrust can build up in such a way that it can keep us from openly loving the people that we love the most and ourselves. And here's the thing I've learned about trust in my own life, is um, you, you can't fake it. There's a lot of virtues I can fake. I can fake honesty. I can fake kindness. I can even fake love. But I can't fake trust. It demands too much genuineness. And we often feel this in our relationships when there's a lack of trust. Even if it's not talked about, you feel it. You know. Because trust means that that engine's purring that the water's clean, that the view is clear. And when we have trust, we grow. When we have distrust, we stop. And there's no problem with distrust. We just need to acknowledge it 
and keep working towards building it in an effective way in our lives. And for those of you, like me, who considers myself a very trusting person, it's funny to see how just the slightest thing going wrong can reveal layers of distrust within ourselves. You know, I learned this a little over a month ago when after almost five years of marriage, I lost my wedding ring for the first time. The whole family gets in the car and we're backing out to go to dinner and I look at my hand and it's not there. And and do you ever have that when something starts to go wrong, you go right into a story? When I went right into the story, you know, that I'm an idiot. (laughs) Josh, you remember every dumb thing you've ever done? I've got a new one for the list. (laughs) And, And so immediately there's this kind of layer of distrust in myself. Josh, someone who does dumb things, like loses his wedding ring. And so that distrust is is revealed there in that experience. But I I do what I'm supposed to do. I think to myself, when was the last time you remember seeing your ring? And this ring, it feels like a a part of me. It's like my cell phone, you know. Um, It's that that much a part of me. You you know, you don't say, when's the the last time you saw your foot? It was just there, you know. It's just a a part of us. But um, I think, you know, what have I been doing the last half hour? And, And I've done a lot. I ironed some clothes, which involved taking an iron out of the closet and clothes out of the closet and putting things back. Um, I brushed my teeth in the upstairs restroom. I blew my nose in the downstairs restroom. Um, I took my daughter and swung her all the way around through the house. Uh, I took out the garbage. I grabbed the mail, opened it, put some in the trash can. I went to the other car to get my mask out so we can go to the restaurant. And so um, I stopped the car before we pull out and I start looking in all of these places. And I'm doing that important affirmation. Maybe some of you have practiced it before. Nothing is lost in God's universe. Have you ever heard that one? <laughs> Nothing is lost in God's universe. Nothing is lost in God's universe. And I'm looking around and I'm, I'm, I'm questioning it. Why can't things get lost in God's universe? <laughs> Does God really care about where my ring is? Would God be so cruel as to take it from me? And so I'm having a crisis of faith over losing my wedding ring in that moment. And so I look everywhere, I can't find it. I get back in the car, we start driving to dinner and I've got a big decision to make, which is do I tell my wife? (laughs) And it wasn't a great act of integrity or honesty, I was just so scared that she would notice it was missing that I decided it was the right thing to tell her. And she accepts it okay and she's quiet for a little while. And then she says, "Um, so why do you think you lost your ring? Do you think there's part of you that subconsciously maybe wanted to lose your wedding ring? Is there a message from the Spirit for us? And it was, it was playful, it was loving, but again, those little layers of distrust can start to pop up in our lives. And so I, I had to make a decision in that moment because my, my, trust was, my distrust was really revealed. Was What was this going to mean, losing my wedding ring? What did I want it to mean? And I had to choose in this moment that this was going to be an experience not of distrust, but of building trust. I lost my wedding ring, and whether I find it again or not, I'm going to use this to have greater trust in myself, greater trust in the divine, and greater trust in my marriage. You know, and worst comes to worst, it at least becomes really good sermon material, right, later on. (laughs) And so... um, we let it go, we, you know, we go to dinner, I look around, I still can't find it, and the, the next night I'm out with a, a friend, one of our wonderful practitioners, Larry Cattell, and uh, I get a text message from my wife, and it's a picture of the ring. I had lost it when I was swinging little Nancy around, and it was stuck under you know, a little chair leg, and I came back, and my wife was really cute, she kind of proposed with it when I came home, so it was a great trust-building exercise, but you know, when we go into those stories, those false narratives, and usually we know they're false, even as we're saying them, it's so important to recognize that as fantastical as our stories of distrust or distruth can be, they can have real consequences, real negative effects. So there's nothing wrong with being distrustful, but there is something wrong with not acknowledging that you're distrustful and not doing the work to build that back up in your life. And it's important to ask ourselves, do I live my life from a place of trust or a place of distrust? And as I'll talk about more next week, living in distrust is exhausting. It is exhausting. Living from trust is energizing. Even if it's a little scary, it's fun and it's fulfilling. 
And I've had to be asking myself the question lately, both in my personal life, especially in my work life. But it, it's, do I live from a place of perfectionism and control or trust and humility? Do you live your life from a place of trying to be a perfectionist and control or from a place of trust and humility? Because perfection and control, in my experience, is all about distrust. It's moving into that dysfunctional way of trying to manage my life from a place of fear, from a place of anxiety, from a place of worry, from a place of distrust ultimately of everything, thinking somehow I'm the only one who can fix it. Right? That's why it's so exhausting. Living from trust and humility, I get to be sincere. Mistakes happen. I learn to trust the people around me to do what they need to do. I don't need to meddle. I just need to show up. I love how the author T. and Dayton put it. She said, attempting to control the outcome of events sets me up for disappointment. It makes me want to manage people and events so that they will not do anything that threatens my idea of how things ought to go. When I attempt to manipulate and manage people, I set up a tension in the dynamic between us. You know, sound familiar so far? I make the event as I see it in my mind more important than the people who are participating in it. I dream myself, others, in situations of their spontaneity, which inhibits all of our connections with spirit and soul. Creativity and spontaneity need to flow freely in and out of reality of time and space so that they can breathe life and energy onto the stage of life. Distrust says stop. Trust says go. Which kind of life are you living? A stop or a go? Or stop, go, go, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Let's get going again. Let's get loving again. Let's get intimate with ourselves and one, uh, one another again. Let's be real again. Let's hurt openly again. Let's be ourselves again. Let's live a thriving life again or keep on living it even, even deeper, even more. How do we build greater trust in our lives? For me, and for many of us, it means acknowledging those places of distrust. Not as negative, not as beating ourselves up, but just realizing that's ultimately not what we want. So stop building the layers of stories around it that help build the fortress of distrust that you get to hide in and start breaking it down and seeking to build those environments, those conversations, those opportunities with yourself, to build that trust again, to learn to love every area of your life again, the best that you can. You know, just trying to bring some emphasis to our relationships, you know, I've learned that um, it makes me chuckle when I hear that a relationship is between two people, not because that isn't true, but the dynamics of relationship are so much more than that. You know, I've learned in relationships that there's at least six relationships always going on in every single relationship. There's my relationship with life, there's my relationship with myself, and then there's my relationship with you. And then there's your relationship with me, yourself, and with life. And we can put it this way, how I get along with life is how I get along with myself, is how I get along with you. And how you get along with me is how you get along with yourself, is how you get along with life. And so sometimes our trust issue isn't even with the person that's before us. It's with ourselves. It's with life, and it's showing up in those negative consequences. And so building trust means that willingness to improve all levels of those relationships. And again, it can get more complicated. You can throw all sorts of other relationships in there. But where am I at in trust with life, with my God? Where am I in trust with myself? Where am I in trust with my partner or my friend or my coworker? And what are those little things I can do to build trust? You know, one thing we're also introducing today that's part of that supplemental material uh, is they're just called trust builders. And they're just inquisitive questions. Questions to journal about, questions to talk with a significant other about, questions to talk with our family around the table about, about or in our small group or in our tribe. Uh, they're simple, but they're compelling. You know, a question for yourself is, if I had a free hour a day for the next year to spend on one thing, what would it be? You know, my initial answer was fourth meal. And, <laughs> but you see, what happens is, you, is you'll give kind of a simple answer, but if you think about it, you go deeper. When I really thought about it, I would spend that free hour uh, writing a book. That's what I would want to do. 
to take that time to care for myself and get you know, all these thoughts that run through on, on a piece of paper. It would be a great act of self-care. That's what I'd really want to do. Uh, a question for your partner or a significant other, a close friend, a parent, a child. The best way to have a courageous conversation with me is? You know, my first answer was some red wine. <laughs> but when I thought about it uh, deeper, you know, I, I want to feel safe. That's what I want. If you want to have a courageous conversation, make sure the environment is safe and that I'm fully present to be able to listen no matter how challenging the conversation. And then there's questions for our, our families or our, our tribe. A good question would be, what is our favorite thing to do together? Or what is a memory of me that will last forever? And these questions are a little dangerous or a little scary at first because what I promise you will happen is they will reveal the distrust if it's there before the trust. So being willing to ask these questions and create the environment to do them, it, it may not make trust 100% right away. That's not the point. It's about taking care of the engine. It's about cleaning up the water. It's about expanding to a wider view of our purpose. And when the engine's purring, our relationships are running. When the water's clear, the fish are swimming. When the view is spectacular, our lives are embraced in a sense of wholeness. One other tool for building trust in your life that I get to share about today, uh, I'm calling five qualities of a resilient heart. Five qualities of a resilient heart, and you'll see the qualities come up on the screen, and I'm not here to give a sermon on each one. The, the point is, what does it mean to live a heart-led life? And if you are willing to lead with heart, you are building trust in your life. And for me, I know it's oversimplifying it, but I'm either living my life from heart or from ego. From heart or from ego. And ego's cool. I have no problem with ego. Um, I, I'm having trouble holding it up right now. It's good to have a healthy ego, but it should never be the leader in your life because where the heart comes from a place of trust, the ego comes naturally from a place of distrust. Sometimes it's healthy, discernment, critical thinking, it's good. But for me, that ego always needs to be in the back seat and the heart always needs to be driving to the best of my ability. And when we look at these qualities of the resilient heart, love, patience, joy, forgiveness, inclusivity, what I want to point out is there's a big difference between these qualities when they come first or when they come second. See, when love comes second in your life, it's conditional. When love comes second, it's designed to be a reaction to something that warms your heart which is very good, but it's very different than when love comes first. Because when love comes first in your life, not only is it unconditional, but it's the first cause for everything that you do. When you lead with love in your life, it creates the foundation and the environment for greater love, trust, and connection to occur. Does it take a lot of trust? Does it make us vulnerable? Yes. So be conscious. But when you can lead with love, you're creating that environment for an intimate and thriving whole life and loving, intimate, whole relationships. I've always found that every argument that I've ever had with my beautiful wife, love has always been the answer. And if we could only lead with love, that trust would be built and most of the problems would solve themselves. When patience comes second, it's about how good you are at waiting. Anyone here really good at waiting? I am terrible at it. I can't wait. It drives me crazy. But when patience comes first, it's not about waiting. It's about uh, leading with heart and going with the flow. It's the recognition that, hey, your schedule, that's cool. I like schedules. I like to-do lists. I like maps. But I know it's not going to work out just that way. It's great to have a to-do list, but I know that life is unique and it's going to create spontaneous opportunities to do other things. I know that the schedule is great. I love plans, but I'm willing to go with the flow. I love maps. I want to know exactly where we're going, but I know deep down that the map is never the territory. And when we show up there, I want to be open to other things that flow. So that's the kind of patience that's heart-led, being willing to go with the flow, which again is building a greater trust 
with life. When joy comes second, it's similar to love, it's conditional. And I, I'll, I'll tell you, when you need something to make you happy, it's a sign of distrust. When we're able to lead with joy, heart-led joy, our joy is unconditioned. It's the joy of being alive itself. It's going, hey, I'm right here in Mile High Church in this vast universe, in this vast time and space. This is pretty cool to be alive right here, right now. Living that miracle of joy in our lives builds that trust that unlocks the key to the possibilities that may seem locked in your life. It will unlock those, living from that heart-led joy. Again, it takes trust. It means being vulnerable, but give it a shot. Forgiveness that comes second is always going to come out of judgment and resentment. It's good to be forgiving, but a heart-led forgiveness is kind of like forgiving before it happens. It's the recognition that we're all human, mistakes are going to be made, and will I choose to build those fortresses of distrust, building stories of resentment and locking myself off from you in the day-to-day, -day? or will I have an attitude of forgiveness that's willing to continuously move on through the present because it always has more gifts for me than any dumb thing that may have happened in the past? Again, it takes a lot of trust. I'm not saying it's easy, but that's heart loud forgiveness. And lastly, inclusivity. When inclusivity comes second, it's always based at some level in distrust and separation. I excluded someone in my life or in my mind or in my heart, and I need to do the work to let them back in. That's good work to do. But when you live in a heart-led inclusivity, no one's left out of your heart from the, the start. It's open to anyone, and again, it's hard. But that, to me, is what it means to live life in total trust in life, in ourselves, in one another. And we still want that ego in the back seat to give us discernment, but we can live from that. I've learned a strange law of the heart, at least in my life, and that is I cannot open my heart to one and leave it closed to another. It just, my heart doesn't work that way. And it's hard sometimes to do, but when I'm in that resentment, when I'm holding someone on the outside, I am refusing to live as one to live in unity. And so it takes forgiveness and it takes love. And we have to ask ourselves when it comes to living our lives, you know, is your heart an open door or is it a steel trap? Is your heart an open door or is it a steel trap? And if it's a steel trap, you, you didn't do anything wrong. But you have the choice to open it back up again. You know, if there was a sign on your heart, would it say, welcome, open 24 hours? Or no trespassing, keep out. Or open from six to seven during happy hour, but that's it, <laughs> right? It, it, it's different timing for different folks, but learning to live that heart-led life takes courage, it takes bravery, but it takes that kind of openness to say there's, my heart is big enough to include it all. And it doesn't mean I don't love some people more than others and may bring people into my heart that I dislike but it means that ultimately I believe in this universe in which I live in. I believe in the ideals of what each of us is capable of accomplishing. And I believe that love is not just a theory, but it is the active creative part of the universe. And I'm gonna stop living outside of it, right? Because when we leave someone out of our heart, we leave ourselves out too. So moving into love, moving into greater trust. I invite you to pick all of these qualities, but in particular, I'm just going to invite you to really choose one right now, one quality of a resilient heart to try and practice a little bit more in your life. Be a good religious scientist and take this idea and, and try it in the laboratory of your life and see if it builds some trust, if it creates some openings where it seems there's only been blockages before to grow and be renewed. So with that, just as we move into prayer this morning, I'm going to share a quote from Ernest Holmes for us to take in, which to me is a, a statement of living in full trust in the universe, in ourselves, and in the possibilities of one another. Learn to be at home in the universe. No more loneliness, no more sense of isolation. See God in everyone, the same God with a different face, the same animating principle with a different form, 
the same divine presence clothed in individual expression. Always your horizon will be expanding, forever filling your life with new hope, new vigor, and new assurance. <laughs>